and uh, and also a good participation uh, from our team here. Uh, as you have mentioned, I would like to start with a uh, very very short uh, description about the uh, subject. Uh, we would like today to uh, to discuss about the uh, impacts and the influence of politics and political uh, decisions on the diversity of internet. Actually, uh, some of the political decisions are affecting uh, internet user uh, users' access to internet, and so uh, as a result it is going to uh, lower the diversity of internet so uh, it's a, uh, i think it's a beginning uh, and uh, we can find a lot of uh, samples of this uh, kind of influence but uh, as as long as we go we can uh, discuss about uh, the reasons and also maybe some solutions for this uh, problem maybe uh, we can uh, finally have a result have a uh, have a conclusion of uh, this discussion uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, my panelists and uh, I will introduce them uh, uh, one by one, but uh, I want them to introduce themselves so, uh, in a few words. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Pedro Les from Google. Pedro, please. Hello, everybody. My name is Pedro Les Andrade. I'm director for public policy and government affairs for Google in Latin America. Uh, well, I'm a lawyer and also a law professor and I have been working on internet policy, internet regulation for the past 12 years and also I'm vice president of public policy of the Latin American Federation on internet, uh, Latin American Caribbean Federation on internet and e-commerce and also faculty of the South School of Internet Governance school that all Thank you. handles. Oh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Pedro. Well, it's better. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, uh, I would like to thank uh, Olga, Olga Cavalli from Argentina. Olga, please. Thank you, Shahram, for your kind invitation. Oh, this is weird. I will take it out. Um, this is strange. I talk and I don't know what I talk. So, my name is Olga Cavalli. I'm from Argentina. I have two main activities. I am an advisor to the government of Argentina in issues related with internet, internet governance, internet policy. I am an engineer, but I have some other studies about business and uh, regulations. And uh, I am also the GAG representative of Argentina in ICANN. And I am a university teacher. I teach networking. I teach technical things at the University of Buenos Aires. And uh, I also um, am the director of a capacity building program for Latin America and the Caribbean, which is called South School of Internet Governance, that Pedro was so kind to mention. Uh, thank Pedro for that. And uh, I am an um, engineer and a mother of two teenagers. Thank you. Is it okay? Yep. Well, okay. Yes. Thank you, Olga. Uh, then we have uh, Mariam Fayez uh, from Egypt. Mariam, please. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Mariam Fayez. Um, I represent civil society here today in this discussion. I, first, I want to say thank uh, Shaharam for inviting me to this session. I'm looking forward um, for a really constructive uh, and any interactive session. Um, I, I, uh, I'm a volunteer uh, and I represent uh, uh, an organization called AFS uh, and its chapter in Egypt. It's called AFS Egypt and we're an, uh, st um, an organization responsible for intercultural exchanges and our main um, interest is youth. And, um, and this is where my interests come. Uh, I have um, an LLM in intellectual property and uh, also I have another uh, job. My, my main job is uh, I work for the Ministry of Communications in Egypt, uh, but in media relations. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. And uh, the last but not the least, uh, we have <laughs> Shu, Shu, uh, Shu Han. Shu Han, sorry for misunderstanding, mispronunciation. Shu, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
This is okay. Um, oh well, just call me home. Um, I'm from academic. I'm a law professor and uh, teaching in Beijing Normal University. I'm also director of Institute for Internet Policy and Law. Uh, the acronym is Double IPL. Um, I'm the faculty chair of uh, Asia Pacific Internet Leadership Program. And this acronym is APIL. <laughs> um, I'm also the vice chair of uh, multi-stakeholder steering committee of Asia Pacific Regional IGF. So we have a lot of acronyms already. Thank you. Thank you, Shu. Well, uh, we can uh, moderate this uh, session as a uh, in a way that uh, uh, first we go to the panelists. Uh, I would like to have some questions from the panelists, and then uh, I don't know. I maybe uh, I've heard that we have to finish at 4 p.m., but uh, we have a delay in in the start, so we have to compress this workshop. But maybe they will uh, they will uh, provide some more uh, time for us. Let's see what happens. Okay, uh, to just go uh, somehow quickly, I would like first to start with uh, Pedro. Pedro, you are from the private sector. So, uh, uh, in your point of view, as a uh, as a uh, representative of a of a global company, uh, how uh, what do you think about this subject? Do you have any samples of the, the influence of politics on the users' diversity? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, indeed, I I, I have. Um, today, we are going to basically discuss how politics affect internet user success and diversity and you know there is an intrinsic relationship between access and diversity in this hyper connect world uh, access to ICT information and communication technologies is fundamental to express diverse opinion we see this as that ICT access uh, becomes a means to an end and we can analyze users access from different perspectives uh, one is connectivity or the lack of it du uh, during certain political movements or during political appeals. We have been witnesses this in the past three years. Uh, the, other, the, other, the, the, the other perspective could be of access to certain platforms uh, that could be used as a way to express diverse opinion or to organize groups that would like to express their opinions. And in, the, in, in this particular example, we have all the online platform for user-generated content, from like YouTube, like Twitter, like Facebook, like social, different social networks that could be used to that end. Another, another way to talk about access is education on the use of those tools, which is also very important. You can have maybe the means, but if you don't know how to use it, it's also difficult. Uh, and I would like to give some examples uh, on how the access has been limited, uh, uh, taking into account these different perspectives. And also, there is no, we also have good stories and we also have good uses of and good political decisions on the way to use ICT to bring the people closer to their government, bring the people closer to the electoral process. Or, and, and I would like to share that with you too. So uh, as examples, and we are not going to point any particular country, but uh, it's, we are under the rules of UN here and we cannot. Uh, but for example, during protest erupting in a country, which is not far from, from here, uh, following the dispute presidential elections in 2009, the central government decided to shut down traditional media. Uh, close off print journalists and also disrupt cell phone lines. So, and also this government also infiltrated in, in, in networks posing activists and using fa uh, fake identities to round up dissidents. Uh, in, in spite of this, the sharing of information used in internet uh, platforms prevail. So YouTube and Twitter at that time were cited by journalists, activists and bloggers as the best source for a first-hand uh, uh, account on, the, on, on what, what was happening on that place. Uh, and it was the only way to show uh, the violence and the different problems that, that happened in that country. But this is, this is you know, a situation in a particular country with 
in, 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 a, in a very difficult moment. But then we can, feel, we can find other examples, maybe in consolidated democracies that has due process, rule of, rule of law, but we can find also a lot of examples that uh, at the end also threaten access and diversity. Uh, another, another way to limit access has to do with unreasonable judicial decisions, maybe uh, grounded on old-fashioned legislative models that uh, basically target internet intermediaries. Uh, and those inter internet intermediaries usually make available put up, uh, you know, online platforms for user-generated content and basically force those internet intermediaries under the threat of either strict liability or you know, criminal liability to take down a given content. Uh, we have a very recent example in a very large Latin American country uh, uh, on, in, where a judge ordered the removal of two videos from YouTube uh, on the grounds that the said videos were defamatory and offensive towards a candidate, a political candidate. Uh, YouTube and Google, you know, YouTube is a, is a, is a, is a, is a Google uh, uh, services refuse to take the videos down on freedom of expression and due process grounds because in this particular case uh, the judge granted an unappealable uh, injunction so uh, and the, the judge never decides in the merits of this uh, of this issue uh, so basically uh, Google refused to, to take down those videos, and this judge considered Google on contempt of the court and, uh, because Google failed to comply with such order and basically ordered the detention of the country manager in Google, Google country manager in that country, and also ordered the, the, the blocking of YouTube in, this, in a particular region of that, of that country. This never didn't never happened, but the, the country manager of Google in that country was taken by the police to a police station to take a declaration and was, as you, as you can imagine, it, it was a very stressful situation for, for Google. We, uh, we, we appealed that decision, uh, but um, they, they, the judge rejected and we, didn't, we have no other choice rather than take down those videos. And uh, this, the, the problem here is that the, this, in the case of Google, Google never has a chance to discuss with the judge what was the underlying rights uh, on this. The judge see this issue as the application of a very old electoral law without taking into account the different obligations that this country has in terms of free expression, in terms of human rights, like the American Convention on Human Rights and other international instruments that will apply to, to this case. So this is another example on, you know, in a different country with a different legal system as a consolidated democracy that these things also happen. And this has an explanation, uh, uh, and it's explained because of old-fashioned uh, legislation, but also the lack of understanding that things in Internet are not isolated and the rights over the Internet are not isolated. So usually something that happened in the Internet might be touching different legislative rea different re uh, legal realities uh, so this is this is a, an, another example but there are also really good initiatives as well and I'm talking about Latin America because it's the region that I know the most uh, and I think that under UN rules we can talk about countries that do good things uh, so I'm going to talk about Mexico and two very good initiatives in order to bring the people closer to the government and bring the people closer to electoral processes. One is about a, a, a project that the Mexican Electoral Authority did jointly with Google uh, and was using Google Maps. And they used Google Maps to basically to point out in the Mexican map all the voting places and with all the necessary information for the, for the, for the citizenship for the citizenship, sorry, to basically cast their vote 
where they have to vote, which were the candidates on each of the regions, and all the relevant information. And it was an amazing success. It started in the, in, uh, four years ago. Now it was reinstated in the past elections. And millions and millions of people in Mexico went to Google Maps through the website of the electoral authority to see where they have to vote. The other initiative has to do with the use of YouTube. And this is something that in many Latin American countries start to take a lot of attention and is how the governments are using these tools to connect better with the citizenship. So the president of, of Mexico decided to uh, have a live streaming in YouTube and also answer questions live in YouTube to the citizen, to the, from the citizenship. This, this initiative was called Ask the President and also has been a major success uh, the, all the people were free to basically cast their, their, their question. Of course, there are rules that you know, they, they should do it in a proper way, but there was no prior filtering of any question. And, and, and the, the, the same happened with many countries in Latin America that are using uh, different tools like YouTube channels to basically show in a daily basis what the government is up to. And a good example is, for example, the YouTube channel of uh, Argentinian government is called Casa Rosada, which is really very well developed. They have a lot of content from the daily conference of the president to, you know, uh, cultural events, uh, music and different, different, very, very interesting, interesting content. And in fact, this channel is one of the most popular channels in Argentina. So I think that this was, you know, a, 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 little, a little overview of what, what we see in, in terms of politics and access and diversity. Very good. Uh, thank you, Pedro. I, uh, as a conclusion, I, th I think you, uh, you talked about uh, uh, actually uh, the decision, the political decisions that uh, has been made, uh, which has a negative impact on the uh, internet diversity or also positive imp impact on, on the diversity. On the other hand, I think there, uh, we have uh, some kind of political decisions which are not made and should be made to, uh, be, uh, to work as a uh, positive uh, uh, motivator of internet diversity. I would like to uh, ask Maryam. Maryam, uh, you are from Egypt, right? And uh, from a Muslim country. We had uh, we had a uh, big issue last uh, in the last uh, few months about uh, one uh, video was uh, which was uh, published in the uh, internet. I, maybe uh, it would be good if a uh, political decision would be made on uh, to uh, actually shut down these uh, kind of reactions. Oh, what do you think about this? And what what other concerns do you have? Um, hello again. Um, um, concerning the film directly, I think um, all, um, all content providers in the future, I think, um, and, and, and a forum like this has to support something like this, uh, should develop our policies together uh, with civil society, with activists, with people who are regular users of the internet, um, um, that uh, would... Act, uh, would um, be um, culturally sensitive uh, because no more, uh, for example, uh, G Google, for example, should not have a one policy fits all. Uh, and, and the movie example was a, a typical situation uh, the, um, because uh, it is sensitive to our part of the world. And uh, part of it is uh, in the core of the religion, some of it is cultural. So I think. Um, my understanding or my belief would be that we should um, sit with, uh, with, develop our policies um, to, um, uh, to, 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 in, to, to, to embrace, to embrace what each culture takes uh, as something very serious. Um, this is how I see it. Thank you. Yeah. What other concerns? What are other concerns? Do you, think? What, do you have? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, what other concerns do you have? Do you have any uh, examples of the influence of uh, politics on the uh, diversity of internet as as uh, as a voice of a uh, uh, civil society? Of course, of course. Um, our revolution was a clear cut uh, example. Um, um, of course, uh, the uh, we had pressures, uh, but um, thankfully that. 
those pressures um, create challengers and create fighters and our youth no more fears and uh, and uh, they went uh, ahead to fight more um, and they made their voice clear and, and and this is what i think i'm here to say today is that uh, instead of <clears throat> governments or uh, politics or whatever pressure the youth and pressure people to uh, direct them or dictate them how to use the internet on the contrary i think it's the it should go the other way and we should embrace them we should embrace their intellect we should uh, empower them and make them um, and and give them the tools to freely uh, grow on the internet and make the internet a better place um, i don't have fears anymore no i don't think so uh, in the past there was fear that the diversity will be affected uh, because of all the political pressures. But now, after our, our uh, revolution has materialized, uh, of course, we still have obstacles, but I am more confident in our youth that will take the way further. Thank you, Maryam. Thank you. Oh, then I would like to go to Olga. Olga, you are a representative of a government, right? So, uh, as, a, uh, as a voice of a government, what do you think about this issue? I would like to thank Mariam Mariam and Pedro's uh, comments because they inspired me. And also, the, I would like to thank Google for the tent yesterday. I think for me it was uh, really, I thought about saying things differently, but it was really inspirational. Uh, I, and I, I take some ideas that Vint Cerf explained to us yesterday very clearly. He said that sometimes governments react when they hear that some other people use the internet for uh, or um, doing something that they fear and uh, sometimes governments try to protect governments which is fine i mean they, they have they have the reasons for that and and that brought me some ideas about the enabling of knowledge into uh, different governments sometimes if you have the information that how good could be to have uh, internet access, how good could be to train your people in understanding the, the technology, in understanding the access to knowledge, in understanding the access to different contents, then you don't fear anymore and you think that is, that is good for, for your government and for your people. And sometimes that information is not so much available. And, um, I think Pedro gave very good examples of uh, old-fashioned rules of law, um, removal of videos, internet shutdown. I am totally convinced that if the people that took those decisions should have had the correct information before, maybe they didn't go to that direction. And I have some examples that I have been involved in in my country and in my region um, there is a very interesting project that takes water to all the, the, the cities of the province of Argentina. Argentina is a federal country divided into provinces. There is a province in the north of Patagonia called La Pampa. They had few water for all the locations. So they, they had a, a big pipe, a regional pipe for all the locations bringing water from the north. But the the, the people involved in that uh, in that project they realized that if they all also installed fiber optic along that pipe of water that would make a change for the whole province and they did and uh, the the money investment in that upgrade was not that much in the whole project uh, amount of, of budget but now the thing is they have water but also every big and small town in that province have also broadband access to the internet at a very very low price so i think this is a fantastic project that shows how the right information in the right moment for the right people could change the life of many people that didn't have access before think about those students that are in the north of patagonia in a very small town now they have access to internet and they can access fantastic content in youtube or Google or any other of the databases that the government is preparing through uh, other projects like Argentina Conectada, for example. Uh, and personally, I thought that this is really important, so I started two different projects. One is the one that Pedro mentioned, which is 
teaching internet governance to Latin Americans to have more Latin Americans into this uh, into these processes. Why they have to be involved? Our region is different from others. Our region is very. It's different. It's, uh, it would take long to explain why, but the, our problems are not the same like Africans or Asians or North Americans or Europeans. It's different. So we have to address our problems and take responsibility for them. So we, we really wanted to increase our participation and we have been quite successful. We have several more participants. Now they are applying for other fellowships in ICANN and in ISOC. And so they, they come and they have their voices here. And also I myself had an idea six years ago when I came uh, from Tunis to my country. I was part of the delegation uh, at the WISIS and um, I, I proposed our minister to teach technology to the diplomats. And uh, uh, he liked the idea. And since then, I, we, we have organized a professorship for, for the diplomats and we teach technology to them. It's uh, very informative, but that has made a, a real change in the new uh, diplomat regenerations. Now they are aware of what is happening, not only in Argentina, but in the world. So when they go and represent Argentina in other countries, they are really well prepared to capture the opportunities for our, our country and the news about technology. So I don't want to take so long, but I think think that accessing the right people with the right information uh, that enables that's we don't have to fear that we have to go for that and every one of us have we all have that opportunity at our environment we have to go forward thank you thank you it's a it's a very good point that uh, everybody in every uh, level of uh, this the stakeholders internet stakeholders that need information to make decisions that's right that's right well, uh, we have also Shu. Shu is a lawyer, and uh, as, a, as long as I know, she's very famous uh, as in, in terms of uh, uh, ICANN and IGF uh, and uh, overall internet issues. Shu, as a lawyer and uh, as, uh, as someone who, is, uh, who looks at the internet in a, uh, in a uh, broader, aspect, uh, broader view, what do you think? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm taking advantage of talking at last. I'm very much inspired by all three speakers. They talk about very much important things that can all be used um, as very persuasive example to point to to demonstrate my point here. Um, so uh, that's a really good arrangement, <laughs> actually. Um, I guess uh, when we were in college, the very first class of political science, we will learn all the politics uh, local. Um, actually, um, politics or political um, uh, settings has never been uh, kind of uh, globalized. There's no such gl global politics at all. So what we're doing right now, what we're talking right now is very much a new issue <laughs> globally. Um, uh, what we can see is a uh, kind of uh, politics based on uh, sovereign states, national states, uh, in the local uh, community, local constituency, uh, local voting, and local uh, legislature. Do we have this institutional setting globally? Of course not. We do not have, what we have is kind of an international structure. Uh, That's um, uh, what we in the morning at the main session, one of the speakers, very interesting, talk about the current IGOs or intergovernmental uh, structure does not accommodate the other stakeholders <laughs> and has lost its legitimacy. This is very interesting observation and is really raising a global issue here. Whether we need new political civilization in the internet age, that's because internet has no border has no states, well, no states has authority all through the internet. It's completely unthinkable and impossible. And whether the current international structure can really effectively address this globalized internet issues. And I just hear from Pedro, very interestingly, the case in Brazil is so impressive. Um, I made a comment on the internet already. This is a, a typical conflict 
between law and internet. It's a conflict between uh, law and Google, but Google basically means internet. <laughs> um, it seems that Google has entered into a legal jungle. You are operating globally or across more than 200 countries, and these 200 countries different laws. There is no centralized government or governance to coordinate these 200 countries. There's United Nations, but I guess you wouldn't like to use that mechanism. It would never be time consuming. So we need a solution for that. How to go to global politics, global uh, political setting. This is a new topic for all of us. What we have right now is the multi-stakeholderism. Uh, uh, this is what we have right now. And we have a couple of examples or experiments. For example, at ICANN, we have multi-stakeholder experiments uh, with so many ICANNers here. You can testify it is good or bad. Is this effective? Um, and we have IGF. This is really multi-stakeholder. We don't know each other. but we Book. Change is privacy, is privacy policy, and the triggered global dialogue. It seems these global corporations, your companies, even though your companies, you are willing to accommodate the other stakeholders from civil society, from academic, from the, the governments, uh, the, 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 the wills from these other stakeholders, and to modify new policy. These are very interesting. And finally, I go back to our uh, Egyptian lady's point. Well, one set does not fit, fix all, especially in the global environment. Uh, and, and, and for this global policies, we need participation of all the all the stakeholders, uh, even though the stakeholder grouping is very much a rough grouping, uh, you, you, you can never be very fair uh, who is uh, uh, eligible to join which group. But it's very much the beginning. Uh, this is about participation, transparency, and especially openness. I emphasize the importance of openness in this uh, new multi-stakeholder global politics. And finally, I hope there should really be an accountability structure in this global political Otherwise, this unfortunate situation uh, will happen again. So, thank you. Thank you, Shu. Thank you. It's, uh, it was an interesting vo uh, point of view, I think. Well, oh, I think we have uh, passed one round. Uh, every, every, uh, anybody asleep? No. Well, I, I, let me, uh, I need to tell you a joke, maybe uh, waking everybody. I forgot to, uh, to introduce two people. One is mine. I didn't <laughs> introduce myself. <laughs> well, I'm, my name is Shahram Sobutipur from Iran. Uh, and uh, I'm part of a civil society in Iran. Uh, and the other one is uh, Sabrina. Sabrina, yes? Uh, or remote moderator. Sabrina, I, uh, I think we have uh, uh, some questions, right? Do we have? No? OK. You just showed me something. OK. Uh, and uh, may I ask the panelists, is there anything you want to uh, discuss and start discussing? Oh. Just, bef just before opening for, for debate on, uh, to the public, I think that it's, it's interesting the, the issue that Mariam bring to the table about the video uh, that generates such a, uh, a, pro, uh, you know, a b violence in different countries and end up with a very tragic outcome. Um, and this, has, this is a great example of access and diversity because you, you were mentioned that one, one rule shouldn't fit for all. And this is, this is the, our challenge in a, in a, in, you know, with a global service. Uh, however, we have set in different solutions. And usually the, the technology came to, to aid these problems. You know, we, for example, what happened, you, you mentioned that we should, for example, block that video. Or, I don't know. Uh, no, it's not that? Okay, great. Uh, that, 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 so I, I misunderstand that. But for example, in terms of diversity, maybe many people in a given country will think that this video shouldn't be up. But there are a lot of people that will enjoy a, a, a movie that has to do with humor and has nothing to do maybe with, you know, with, with, with a real attack to a given community. And this is a different perspective from different parts of the world that what might, might, might look funny 
in one country could be totally aggressive for the other country. Uh, this, before, before technology, this randomly happened. Usually, shocks remain local. Humor remain local. When humors became global, it's difficult to accommodate that to different cultural standards also. And I don't want to minimize the issue in terms of just humor. Uh, very, very, very complicated things happen about, around this. But, and, and this is, and, and for example, we have been able to put, you know, IP blocking in order to not make available that video in given countries. Then we have been criticized with uh, different groups that say, why you uh, made an exception? And, you know, exceptions are usually for exceptional situations also. If we see that something is going to cause such a big issue that the life of people will be uh, under threat, we might have to take those. And they're really difficult decisions. And usually it's a problem with internet intermediaries that they got caught in the middle. And because we, we, we don't want to be judges, we don't want to be executors. Uh, and, and when we receive, for example, a formal, a formal petition from, a, from, a, from, a, from an authority that is in line with our local law, we, we try to complain with that also. And we try to accommodate our operations to the different countries where we are providing, providing services. And, but we still have our big compromise with free expression. And in some countries that the situation is so difficult that we cannot uh, uh, assure the, the respect of, uh, 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 of, of human rights, sometimes we have to decide not to provide services there. Uh, and this is you know, just a, uh, a thought about what, what happened in, in, in Egypt and in Libya. Yes, I agree completely with everything you said, and I confirm. I said I agree with everything you said, and I confirm. Of course, we, nobody should block anything. Uh, content is free. Everybody should uh, get access. Uh, all I was saying is that in policy development and guidelines and um, uh, guidelines for usage and guidelines for posting and everything, um, some sort of collaboration should happen with different stakeholders, with the corporations, so they would uh, develop the the applicable policy that would fit and would make everybody comfortable. That's all what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Miriam. I think that um, we hear a lot uh, a war which is multi-stakeholderism or multi-equal stakeholderism. I think we should go a little bit further and take it to our own lives. We should act as that and we should try to uh, the structures that rule in uh, the uh, organizations and countries and, and provinces of, of our places should have that in mind, that it, it, it implies patience, it implies cooperation, and implies comprehension of new things. If you have some time to think about before making a decision, perhaps half an hour, one hour, one day, I don't know, I have the right information, maybe you don't decide something that could be harmful for some content or for some people. So we, we should put that inside of our thoughts, not only knowing that there is the IGF and there is ICANN, and there are some new institutions which are multi-stakeholder, but to act like a multi-stakeholder thinker and in our environment and try to make that change. Because Hong said something very interesting. Will we have someday an accountability structure, global accountability structure? We don't know. We, perhaps we perhaps we never achieve that. There are several countries, and all countries are different, and so we have a lot to go further. But in the meantime, we have many things happening. So we should add something, some time to think, and some patience, and some coordination and cooperation with the multi-stakeholder thinking. Okay. Thank you, Ola. Thank you, the panels. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, leave the floor to, uh, for the participants. We have, uh, I think we, uh, formally we have a half an hour to uh, have an uh, open discussion. Is there any mic available? Any mic? Yes. Thank you. You, we have, who? You, you, yes. Who else? Okay, thank you. The lady, please. Can please, you sir, first uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Jerusalem.
Uh, I work for a feminist organization in Egypt called Nazra for Feminist Studies. Uh, coming back to the Egypt example, uh, actually about the video, uh, the reason there is a lawsuit uh, on Google and YouTube because of uh, blocking the video and coming out again. Uh, I don't think we want to go into the conversation of talking about uh, cultural relativism of religion and culture and then make 10 different policies. It's really good that actually we have one policy because it's already complicated for the mainstream user. Plus, uh, Yanni, I think we're getting the whole debate back when we say there's cultures and religious sensitivities that people should take care of. Well, this is freedom of expression. If you don't want to view the video, don't look at it. If you don't want to, if you want to see it, go ahead and see it. But nothing, nothing justifies violence. So having a video online doesn't justify burning embassies and killing people. So in any way, this shouldn't be uh, a justification. And another thing, as, any, as a way out of this dilemma, uh, having like a due process of removal of items online and involving users in decision making, this could be the solution. I have two examples, one from Flickr.com, uh, which removed a whole album, uh, which an Egyptian activist posted on um, the entrance of the security service when, uh, when activists went into it and they, looked, they uh, uploaded pictures. Uh, the album was removed without any information for uh, the user, saying that it's not his photos, which was not the case. And another uh, blog post that was removed on blogger.com uh, for also an Egyptian blogger. And then there was a whole negotiation for a few months with Google Egypt on why was it removed. And the, the blogger wanted to have the, the official complaint. And at the end, no, no one ever did something like this. So I think involving the user is very important. And I think also keeping an eye to the fact that this should remain a free space for everyone, for freedom of expression. And there's really nothing to justify any blockage of videos or any other forms of freedom of expression online. Thank you. Well, I, I think that I, I completely agree. Um, it's uh, the from from principles to reality. Sometimes it's it's a, diff, it's a little bit difficult to take some calls. It's a. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, I assure you that every time we try to, to do the best for our users. Uh, but there are certain, uh, certain situations uh, that, you know, we don't want n to create violence or that. And if we see that there is an issue that will put in, in risk people's life, even if it might, might go, you know, against our, uh, some of our main and core principles, sometimes for for a time being and for a particular moment, we have to take some difficult decision. But as you as you mentioned, the video was back, uh, and you know, and we might, and also we have to be able to maybe make a mistake. This is this is also we are even even as Google is uh, looks like a program. There is also people behind Google, and we can also sometimes, uh, and it's good to have always you know civil society, academics different different multi stakeholder helping us to take the right decisions and you know now what we also have is global feedback so when we when we make a mistake we we have global feedback about that also and i think that this is part of the of, of the system we we cannot think about a system that is flawless uh, it's it's called always is going uh, we, we we will find this we will try to minimize that uh, but i think that this kind of dialogue and the existence of different stakeholders and that we can be in the same room and that basically I, I, I want your feedback I want that and I, I, I really I don't have anything to say to I, I, I won't refute your arguments because you're right in some ways and if, if we fail to provide enough information well this is, this is a mistake from our side but it's going to be fixed and this is what we try to do with the transparency report for example um, so this is thank you Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I was thinking about the changing the name of this workshop. I think it was a mistake. We, have, uh, we are now uh, talking about the influence of politics and diversity on each other. Yeah. Because it's, it's a circle. It's going, going and coming back. OK. So please.
I have a question for uh, Dr. Subutipu. Given that you are the organizer of the, this, this uh, workshop and you are from Iran, I was wondering if you can comment on the situation in Iran with regard to the access to uh, internet in Iran and the diversity uh, of the content available. Given that all the, all the platforms that your colleagues on the panel they talked about, they are blocked in Iran. YouTube is blocked, Facebook is blocked, Twitter is blocked, and even the websites of the former presidents in Iran, they are blocked. I was wondering if you can comment on the situation, and given that you are from the, you know, the representative civil society in Iran, you can also talk about the solution if you can. Thank you. First, uh, I would like uh, to uh, express some of the rules which are uh, uh, covering this uh, UN, uh, what we say, UN events. We should not mention a specific country in this uh, actually workshops, yes. But uh, just uh, to clarify some things, I'm not a rep representative of every government, any government or anybody else. I'm just uh, here for myself. As a person, as, a, uh, as an individual, as a, civil, uh, as a member of a civil society in Iran, yes, we are suffering from some uh, uh, kind of blockage, but not just uh, from our uh, government. Uh, uh, we are also suffering from uh, some blockage from other governments to, all, uh, to actually to all citizens. It's uh, because of sanctions. So, uh, who is the who is the loser? I think people are the loser in this case. Justice. Thank you. My name is, can you hear me? Yeah. My name is Petr Matjašić. I'm uh, originally from Slovenia, and I, I'm president of the European New Forum, a civil society organization in Europe who works on empowering young people, and IFS is one of our members in Europe, at least Tripoli YFU, as they're called, and EFIL in Europe. Um, first, I want to just say for the record, I think it's bullshit that we can't talk about countries, because in Kenya last year we did, and there was no problem, and it's a free internet speech that we are talking about here, so I even though I don't have a question about countries, I just wanted to make that point because it's important for us to always be open. I came here to talk about politics, and so far I have to admit that I haven't heard that much politics. I heard concrete examples, which is great, uh, and it's important to talk about concrete examples, but it would be great to pick up a bit on what Professor uh, Hong Shu was mentioning in terms of the more broader perspective on internet governance at global level. Is there such a thing as global accountability? I personally think there should be because we have certain rules and norms on the internet which is borderless uh, that is based itself on, yes, the famous most used multi-stakeholder approach, but also there's teeth behind that. There's some values in which we believe that are global, that everybody here in this room shares, even though our governments might not. So I think it's important that we hear from you directly, from Google as a company, what your approach globally is when it comes to freedom of speech and especially when it comes to the topic of this in terms of securing access to people, uh, people having access to the internet. Then to hear from the government, because we have in Europe governments that give free access to internet, such as Estonia, and we have others where you have to pay for it constantly and a lot. So how do you reconcile that as a government? What kind of political decision and where do you take that decision? Is it the president who takes that decision? Is it the discussion in the parliament? How do you do that? And then for our colleague from Egypt, of how do you, because you said you work a lot on empowering uh, young people. How do you do that concretely? Because that's what we are trying to do. We organized the youth event before the IGF <laughs> with the help of Google as well, among others, to actually do that and bring people here so they can listen and take part. How do you do that in Egypt and where we could create synergies at the global level of this capacity. Thank you. S thank you for thank you for your your observation. I think that uh, you're right. We we didn't we are starting the debate. So it's great that you set the grounds for it. Uh, and you I think that is uh, in terms of uh, which are going to be the politics that will drive, you know, the, a global consensus or a global respect on basic human rights. And I think that we have uh, very good um, initiatives. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the joint declaration on, uh, on freedom of expression on the Internet that was passed last year by the 
Rapporteurs of Freedom of Expression of Europe, uh, the Americas, the Organization of American States, Africa, and uh, who else? Was one more, and UN. UN. Uh, this is a great. This is a great text. This is a great way to think about uh, international harmonization. It's difficult to. Uh, it's it's really difficult to come with an international treaty that will agree on, you know, notice and take down or. Uh, different ways to guarantee free expression online. But if we can push all of our respective countries to adopt the same models that are proposed by different free expression organizations or human rights organizations, this is a good start. Uh, I think I invite you to take a look to this, to, to this uh, joint declaration. It's a beautiful language. It takes, you know, uh, many of the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, many of the principles of the America's Declaration on Human Rights, and many other instruments around the world, and adapt it to the Internet reality. And they have a very interesting principle there that says that Internet should, shouldn't be ruled by the same rule of traditional media, like telephone or like other mediums. And this is, this is a good a great principle for a start in terms of thinking about how we will be able to handle the the challenges of uh, uh, you know granting different human rights on on, on, an, on an online environment there are other they, they, they address different issues like uh, removal of content like filtering like what how 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 grave it is to block a site which is almost the same to basically block a printing press or block a radio station. They are very, uh, you know, radical solutions for, for a particular problem. So I think that we have a way to work on that. I would love to be able to, that m most of the countries represented here at the ICS will agree to, to a certain set of principles for the internet. We, I think that we are, uh, we are at an early stage for that. Uh, that, but we can start to do a you know, a, a work country by country or at regional organizations to start to try to find those common standards uh, and then, you know, move forward. Thank you very much. I think you did a very, very good question, very inspirational, at least for me. And you allow me to talk a little bit about my region and why I said it is different from other regions. Latin America is a region that is very unequal. Everything is very unequally distributed. Wealth, um, infrastructure for telecommunications, um, infrastructure for internet. Also, we have another problem. This the geography puts us in the south of the south, especially Argentina, it's the south, south of South America. So our connectivity to the international backbone of the internet, it's much more expensive than what you can achieve in Europe or North America, of course. So this brings us several challenges. You have the national challenges of connectivity. Big countries with a beautiful geography, beautiful places, but that's challenging for connectivity because you have big mountains, big rivers, big forests. So um, luckily, what happened, I think it started in, in, in WISIS in 2005. All the countries started slowly but surely. Um, a learning process about what is important for allowing people to be connected to the internet. Argentina is now developing a very, very ambitious and very interesting project for connectivity for, with a high capillarity of all, for all the, the, the small towns and big towns of the country. What happens is my country is very well connected in the middle because it's a long country, big country, but in the middle because it goes from Chile to Sao Paulo and, 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 and Rio. So that area, it's well connected and prices of access are relatively reasonable but to the north and to the south it's not the same so national backbone is an issue especially for people that is less connected in the north and in the south and they need it more because they are far away from from the places or where the information is developed so now um, the government of argentina is developing a project which is called argentina conectada that it's installing 30 i'm not good with numbers in english 30 30 thousand kil uh, kilometers of fiber optics uh, 70,000? He, he knows more than me. <laughs> 70,000, which is a lot. It's a big country anyway. So if you look at the map, it's in the webpage, argentinaconectada.gov.ar. 
and you can see the capillarity and it's really very nice project also the government has gone a little bit further and now there is a digital tv project you can access free digital tv of high quality video quality uh, now there are online maybe pedro knows more than me 20 channels and it's go it's going up and most of them are educational and um, content for children or especially developed from the government uh, which are very good and other channels are adding to that uh, to that grid of, of content um, interesting thing is this is happening in other countries of the region uh, in, in Brazil in Peru in Chile uh, Mexico all countries and other very interesting thing is that UNASUR, which is the union of the countries of Latin America, is thinking of building uh, a network in between all the countries in Latin America. This is from the government, but also private sector has a, and also civil society is doing very interesting thing in, in installing internet exchange points. You know, when several ISPs go together and buy together capacity, you can uh, you can offer us a good, better service for lower price. And in Argentina, there are several. I think it's more almost ten internet exchange points, not only in Buenos Aires but in other cities in the interior. Brazil has much more, and there are other countries that didn't have before and are, are having one now. And there is one regional internet exchange point. So. Uh, from the government, from the private sector and civil society, this is happening. And I think it's a process that started like five or six years ago. And it's really blooming now with all these initiatives. Okay. Basically, um, to answer your question directly, um, what is unique and nice that uh, since the revolution, um, people are taking matters in their hands, especially members of the younger generation, and, and this is the beauty of it. So many uh, local organizations uh, and international ones have offered uh, training, have offered um, local initiatives to start, uh, whether it's um, citizen journalism activities uh, from, uh, from how to stay anonymous to how to write, how to post, how to do everything, and even underground music and culture and everything developed and thrived and is up till now, I think the matter is continuing and continuing aggressively in monitoring the government's performance, sometimes mocking it, sometimes, you know, but, uh, but this is going on and going on live. Um, um, on the level of our organization, um, the Internet has not in, been an integrated part in 100% uh, in the exchange experience, but it is uh, taking place. Um, in the past, when the government used to have uh, Internet safety and cyber peace initiatives and all this, um, our organization uh, participated locally and internationally. And, um, and any activity now that we promote, that we do, whether in intercultural learning or just core exchanges, we integrate uh, how to use Internet, safe use of Internet, uh, social media, and how to empower. The, um, if I go back, the, 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 the normal... Um, the way our organization works is very traditional. We are a typical uh, exchange organization, so we're used to letter writing. We are used to exchange students um, immersed in their community and don't call back home and don't uh, communicate with your friends. And this is what we promote all the time. But of course, with the, with the development of social media and internet, and, and especially our revolution when our students were there, were in their exchange uh, host countries, it was impossible. It was impossible to prevent them and not them, make them part of, of, of history. Uh, we changed the strategy worldwide. And uh, we are uh, embracing uh, more and more internet in our daily activities and routines, and it's working beautifully. And we are education, uh, educating our youth more and more how to use it uh, in, in, uh, and, and allowing them to contribute and to develop their thoughts as well. Thank you. Yeah, hello, my name is Shadia Buzara, and I just wanted to pick up on a similar point also, uh, Mr. Chairman, you earlier t talked about the, the cycle between uh, users and uh, policy and back again, and, and I'm, I'm missing a little bit in this debate the, the influence of users and diversity of users in that decision making, so um, both on international but also on a local level, um, I mean, um, locally, 
we brought up the example when a judge makes a certain decision, on what basis and how are users involved in that decision, in that rulemaking um, f for the local community. Also on a global basis, uh, when an international corporation develops guidelines on what constitutes hate speech, um, how are users involved in this, and, and diverse users for all. I, I completely agree with the idea that one size doesn't fit all. Um, there are local differences, there are local um, norms to what constitutes acceptable and not acceptable things. Um, and, and the question really is how to involve those diverse users in each, be it locally or on, or on a global level, uh, to, to, to ensure that, that um, the right decisions are made and that we don't continue to have the skew, um, the, the cultural skew or the cultural bias on the internet that we actually have today and, and, and really have um, content that works uh, uh, across the different um, cultures. Well, yes, of course, that um, always is a challenge to be able to attend the different requests from different users all over the world. But in fact, we, we're working on this in different ways. Working with civil society that represent collectively the interests of different groups of users. And also, uh, for example, in, let me give you an example with YouTube. We have the, the flagging system for YouTube videos. Usually the community is, is also our best ally to let us identify which videos could be against our policies. And always our policies evolve because of the feedback that we get from the community. And this is something that has been evolving. And of course, that is really difficult to come up with a universal uh, definition on what could be considered hate speech or violent speech. Uh, but we learn from the community. And usually, the community is, the, is our first alert when something is going on in our platforms. And it's, it's working pretty well. Uh, of course, there is much room for, for improvement, but I think that, you know, continue working with the, with the civil society and also the IGF. Uh, the IGF is a great forum to learn about concerns. And I have been participating for the past, since 2007 in the IGF. And I can tell you that after each IGF, I came back with a lot of feedback and since has been changed after. So this is also, you know, the great thing of, 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 the, of this forum as well. For us, it's a great way to understand what is maybe not going so well, what we need to correct. Thank you. Is it working now? Okay, great. Um, obviously, it's good to have the IGF and to have multi-stakeholder discussions. And I don't think it's unique because I think it also happened in the climate change negotiations where I think there were uh, similar tripartite discussions. But I, oh, I should just say who I am. Uh, I'm, um, my name's Helen Goodman and I'm a member of parliament in Great Britain. But I must admit, I am a little bit worried about allowing the large companies and the large businesses to elide their interests with the interests of the users because I don't feel that their accountability arrangements are uh, as good as, for example, a democratic government by definition. Uh, you know, it's elected or it's thrown out as we were thrown out two years ago. And so, um, I don't feel very comfortable with um, with what's happening at the moment. And to be absolutely honest, I think the what's happening is what we used in the old days to call ideological imperialism. We're getting a very American picture of freedom. And for myself, speaking as a European, I think it's a little bit unnuanced. I, I'm closer to thinking what Mariam thinks, actually. Hi. Hello. It's working uh, because I was with the 
I couldn't hear myself, sorry. Uh, I'm uh, Eleonora Rabinovich from the Association for Civil Rights Argentina. Uh, thank you all, all the participants in the panel. I would like to make a comment as Pedro talked about the hate speech issue, which is very um, problematic and sensitive. And I think that it's very important that uh, in general private companies and private entities don't uh, create their own standards in terms of what we consider human rights and and the limits and the boundaries of human rights. So, especially about uh, hate speech, I, I I have learned that the last UN um, Freedom of Expression uh, Rapporteur uh, report uh, that I think that has been approved uh, recently and. Uh, it's uh, spe specifically about hate speech and how to deal about hate speech and about the necessity of looking for other non-legal uh, responses for attacking and preventing uh, that kind of discourse. So uh, I think that as we are talking about human rights, it's important that we are catching up with the last uh, human rights standards on these issues. And Uh, Nadine uh, Sharif uh, with the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies and uh, I just want to start with uh, reiterating I think that companies should not be given the way to decide what is and not uh, what is and is not um, applicable and I think it gives us a good standard with human rights the discussion is happening elsewhere and they should look to that and shouldn't compromise that um, on uh, local policies I think that should be the basis and should go above that not below that in any sort of policy discussions um, um, local differences there are, um, but I think it's also important to know that we're talking now about a global community. I was uh, in the U.S. during the Egyptian Revolution and engaged via Facebook. Um, my engagement via Facebook uh, was because Facebook's policy did not allow for anonymity. So I was there the sort of firewall for some of the Facebook users. Um, the I got into a sort of uh, debate, and this is really having to do with the the political engagement of Facebook with governments and how it affects their users. I got in into, into a sort of in a coffee shop in a debate with one of their um, uh, policy um, I don't, I, I associates, I guess he was. Um, and the, uh, the discussion revolved around the use of anonymity. And the issue he said is that Facebook is a company, it worries about its bottom line, it has to protect its staff and its access in a country, and therefore could not provide everything that human rights advocates want. I agree with that sort of idea that this is the, this is the sort of where Facebook comes to the sitting at the table, but I think it's really, really problematic. Um, and um, protecting users should be a company's first obligation because users and not governments are your constituents, are your base. Um, and I know that that is true at times with Google and there have been times when there has been pushback to Google and you've mentioned quite a few. My question actually lies is where do you feel that political engagement with a country should lie? I know where I feel, but from a corporate sp perspective and specifically from Google's perspective, where do you feel that engaging with a country um, or a government, um, you said the, the, the question of Argentina, but you, uh, and I'm, if I remember correctly, you had to take down the video in the end, correct? The the video. It was not. It was not on Argentina, but. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, the, the video had to come down at the end. So where where does that lie for Facebook? No, not no, we're talking a different, different case video, in Latin America. It was taken down we, because otherwise my, our, our 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 director, our country manager, will be in jail. But th that's the kind of question I have, is mm -hmm. when it becomes a question of Google company versus the user, um, where does that lie? Well, we, we always, we always uh, you know, that one of our principles is that the user is first. But we, we need to be realistic. You know, we won't, we won't let one of our employees to go to jail. Uh, I, you know, it's, 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 it's really difficult, you know. So it's a, it's, it's a question of... Uh, 
how how you protect your your people also you know and, and I agree with that that position I'm just saying like where other than that how far are you willing well, to we go continue we continue working right now for example we're engaging with the with the government to basically improve their and we have been working before with them on that on that front it's very difficult to use online uh, online tools during political campaigns in that country because of this uh, you know old-fashioned legislation so we work in different fronts my, my work as you know, uh, as head of policy, is engaged with governments and they engage with different stakeholders. And I think that also in connection with, I, I don't want to talk about another company, but, you know, you mentioned the, the, the requirement of that Facebook is not, not let you uh, uh, use the service an anonymously. There are, we need to think about that there are a lot of options in the internet. Maybe that, that, that social network for the purpose that you want was not the best one because that's not protect your anonymity. But you have the choice to elect different platforms. I know that is, you will say, well, come on, this is you know, the, the biggest social network. Uh, and it's a question of reach. And uh, it's, it's difficult. But they are, the question is that there are, no, are other options. And I don't know. I think that also it's it's a question of freedom of how you want to design your your platform. You know, you have to be free to design a platform in a way that you say, well, I want a platform that everybody identifies themselves. I, I won't say that this is good or bad, but the freedom to do that is also important. Uh, so I think that it's not a question of how how a service is provided in some way. Uh, I, I agree with, with, with accountability. You know, if you, if, you, if you have a compromise with your user to act in a certain way, you need to be accountable for that. But then we need to think about that Internet is also about choices and that we fortunately have a lot of choices and we need to protect that also. We need to protect the way that, this, uh, that different uh, platforms are created. This is, this is key in, in connection with intermediary liability. The lack of good protection for internet intermediaries will help to concentrate the offer only the big guys that will have, you know, the big bugs to basically stand up in front of a government and say, okay, I'm going to appeal. I'm going to put my resources to appeal. I'm going to use, you know, my user base to basically stand up for something that we believe that is, that is important. But we need we, we really need rules that will protect the small platforms so they can provide you an option that will be more suitable for your needs. And this is what we are facing right now. Europe has been doing great things in terms of that on the e-commerce directive where they provide a, a really good safe harbor for internet intermediaries. We are trying to do the same in Latin America. So all, all the entrepreneurship in, in Latin America in terms of online platforms has to do with, they are taking a lot of risk because there is no clarity of what will happen with an internet intermediary if a user will, will post something that might be deemed illegal or inappropriate in a, in a given country. So I think that we need to work all together on that and foster this environment in order to create more platforms that will suit the different needs of the different users. Well. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Uh, we are already run out of time. Let's just uh, have a time for one last question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, Omar Mansour Ansari, and I'm uh, from Afghanistan. I preside over the National ICT Alliance of Afghanistan. Um, my question is, um, uh, when we are talking about uh, public policy and uh, presenting something for uh, a public policy debate, um, we should be including uh, all nations in all cultures. Because when we are talking about internet, it's not about a specific country. It's not about a specific religion or culture, right? Um, we are coming here together uh, uh, with a variety of backgrounds. Some of us are from the United States, some are from uh, Europeans in Afghanistan, Egypt, uh, Muslim countries and Christian countries and different religious and cultural backgrounds. Um, but you see there um, 
when I say internet doesn't have any boundaries, uh, content on the internet is added uh, and removed uh, based on certain countries' policies. Those policies are not uh, 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 national policies or public policies in other countries, right? Um, but it's affecting the lives and businesses and uh, uh, in the way people behave in other countries. Uh, the example uh, uh, friends have uh, mentioned is the video um, about Prophet Muhammad, let's say. Um, that has really hurt uh, hurted a lot of uh, people in, in my region and it's created a chaos uh, in, in my region. Uh, even uh, some of the countries went to, you know, some, some of the uh, people were dead. Now, you're not removing the video because uh, the policy in the United States does not allow you. Uh, one man created that video because he has the right to uh, speak, right? And the other person's life was put in danger. The whole country is uh, turning into a chaos. I didn't have access to Gmail because uh, the Afghan Telecom, which is the state-owned company, has put a ban on YouTube so people cannot see the video and they uh, don't demonstrate uh, and uh, chaos does not, uh, is not created in, a, uh, in the country, right? And there will be political issues and all this. But I did not, uh, they, they forgot that uh, mm, they should, uh, they should uh, uh, remove, let's say, uh, Gmail or uh, Google Apps and all these from the filter list. Every Google uh, service and application, uh, that was uh, a filter. For three, four days, we didn't have access to Gmail. We could not even browse the internet, uh, the Google itself. So which one is good? Uh, g adding a video based on a U.S. policy uh, uh, on the internet or b uh, b uh, b banning access of a whole nation because of one person's freedom of expression, which one is good? This one uh, question of mine. Um, uh, and don't be angry because uh, some, some of us might be angry because uh, why are you not thinking the way I think? I was born in another country. My policies are different in the culture. Everything is different there. Uh, there are people who are uh, uh, thinking strategic. There are people who think uh, really emotional. And uh, people in my region are emotional rather than strategic. And you have seen the examples. Um, so uh, mm, when you present something as a public policy debate, and there is a policy that affects the whole of the, uh, the world. Um, but I think we should look at the uh, other ways as well. I'm not um, following certain countries' uh, policies, and this is my question. The second question is with relevance to Iran, although you've said we cannot talk about specific countries. Uh, but I heard Iran is creating its own internet. Uh, uh, it will be allowed within the people could get connected within Iran, but they could be isolated from the rest of the country. Is it true that Iran is working on that? And if it's true, uh, what's the pro What's the status now? Um, thank you. Well, s you, you're right that you know there are many services that might be following certain policies that has to do with sometimes with the place where these services provided from. And of course that when a, a company starts to become larger and larger, they start to touch different legal systems. Uh, it's, this is a challenge with the internet, how, how, you, how you interact with the, with the different jurisdictions, with the different sovereign states. Uh, uh, I don't think that I have an answer to how, how, how this should be addressed. Um, but we are presenting the, for example, this, this, this case of the video. We are presenting, you, you mentioned that this video caused a lot of harm to many people. Uh, but we are presenting internet as is broadcasting. 
as internet chats enter into your life or the video enter into your life uh, and you you are a passive su subject that just you know turn on the tv and this video appeared this th we need to also think about how you can access to that video you look for it this is you know and and we when when you mentioned that people was killed people was not killed because of the video the people was killed because people were so radical that decided to take the uh, another people's life because they were upset of a video that they look at and they will and they actively search for it and you know the video is not only on uh, was not only on youtube was also in different in, in different platforms so and it's really it's really difficult uh, to be completely honest to say how we are going to be able to accommodate the the different cultural difference the different legal systems uh, from 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 a global services uh, and and you were concerned about what happened in in Iran about having a a particular internet and I think that this is tied also to your to to your question about that because if you say well I want an internet that is only uh, governed by my own standards is that not a closed internet in some way because if you want to be part of a global network we you need to be also willing to accept diversity in terms of public policies in terms of uh, legal standards which is you know difficult sometimes and sometimes could could hurt uh, if I understand correctly you're representing Google right uh, yes okay um, you have uh, uh, for let's say um, uh, China you have certain content that's censored right we are, we are out In, of China for that for for China yeah it's censored right mm-hmm um, isn't that like sort of a double policy that uh, Google is playing? Why is it uh, censored in China and censored? Mm. No, no. I think, the I think that you don't understand. Uh, we left China. We are not providing the search services from China because of that. We basically resigned the biggest market, the biggest internet market in the world mm. because okay. of that. Okay. So this is this is like an example of our commitment to. To protection of human rights, we are not providing ser Google search in China because, because of that. Because of the government. Because of right. censorship. Because of the government censorship. What if the users demand removal of certain content? They have a process for that. They have a process. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, the participants. Uh, we are already run out of time. Uh, I would like uh, to thank everybody for active participation and hopefully uh, we will uh, have uh, some continues on this uh, subject in the future. Thank you everybody.